this has been a fascinating panel for me to, to, to think about organizing. Um, a lot of the places that we go, the, the, the concept of patient centricity gets put in your face and every reception that you walk into now has pictures of patients smiling and staring into the distance and, uh, and I know most of you are smiling internally at the truth of that. Um, but every time I ask someone what patient centricity means at their organization, it's very rare that someone's answered the question or even asked the question about what's, what that means. Uh, so as we begin to dig into that, that, that issue of what it means to use the word patient, what it means to use the word centric, what it, used, what, what it means to be focused on patients, um, I realize two things. One is that some companies haven't thought about it very hard. The other is that some people have thought about it very hard and are doing really exciting things and hence this panel. We are trying to put the patient at the center. In fact, maybe flip it a little bit on, the, on its edge. Um, I lead what we call the disease interception accelerator, which is builds on the premise that most people don't want to be a patient. Most people don't want to be sick, right? We, we do it because we have a disease and we need to be, to be taken care of. But with the recent changes and in, in advances in life science technologies, what would happen if we could identify people who were at risk, um, understand the progression to disease and stop it or intercept it before they ever got there? Um, and we know that different, our understanding of early disease biology and frankly, early disease psychology is different for different diseases. Um, we tend to think that the treatment needs to go through this certain rigor. However, with the changing landscape, and I think nowadays getting uh, more real-time data um, in the landscape of, of the clinical development from very early stage throughout approval, um, we can incorporate all this knowledge to really run clinical trials much more in a real, real life fashion. Um, obviously, there's always this fine line balance to meet the rigor of clinical trials and prove that certain point of efficacy that we are looking for within the whole holistic view of the patient and symptomatology of that, that particular patient, because we, are, we would like to get a label approval for certain aspects of, of that symptomatology. Um, oncology is, from, from that perspective, um, although it's a very, very um, debilitating. So from an oncology perspective, I think it's a complicated question. I think right now most of our trials are ECOG performance status zero to two. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it means you're still ambulatory and you're one of the more healthy patients diagnosed with cancer. I think in the real world, a lot of patients are ECOG three. There was actually an FDA uh, Brookings Roundtable about this a few months ago where this was brought up as a challenge. The issue is if we were to enroll um, an ECOG three patient, they might progress within four weeks. So then we're not able to effectively measure the efficacy of the treatment. Um, so I think in some ways the current clinical trial framework is challenging in terms of enrolling a set of patients that's very comp concordant with the external world. Yeah, I, I agree very much um, what you're saying in terms of engaging with patient advocacy groups. It can really move the needle with, with certain populations and it obviously it also depends which region we are um, we are functioning um, given the global scale of m most of our trials certain countries it's just non-existing so I think co we're constantly finding newer and newer ways to communicate to patients and also to those individuals either caregivers or physicians obviously uh, who ha have access to uh, uh, that, that particular patient population that we would like to target. Um, like, for example, for an Alzheimer's trial, and there, um, the engagement is obviously not necessarily immediately with the patients, but with the caregivers and the caregiver centers and, and communities uh, who are taking care of, uh, of, uh, of patients with debilitating diseases. And it's just not just Alzheimer's, but others as well. And I think I'll answer it at two levels. Um, I think at a high level, there's patient-focused drug development. I think if folks are familiar with that, that's an initiative from the FDA to un better understand what aspects of disease burden and treatment burden are most important. I think the number one thing we can do that I think we don't do as good a job as consumer health does is qualitative research or actually understanding what our customer wants. You know, I sat at a dinner last night 
um, around the Digital Health Summit I'm part of was someone who said to me, do you really think pharmaceutical companies you know, know their customer as well as a number of consumer health companies he named? And I thought, wow, no, right? Like, so I do think spending more time doing qualitative patient research um, to ask patients what's relevant to them and then construct an outcome um, of interest in a trial, make an endpoint to measure that, and then choose the right tool is something we need to do more of. I mean, the Roche tagline is kind of doing now what patients need next, and that's very much the Genentech perspective. I mean, when I came to Genentech to kind of start this group, it was made clear to me that if we're the leader in cancer care, we need to be the leader in understanding the impact of cancer on patients. And I've been very fortunate that we've had a, a heavy support of revenue to create new endpoints to better measure the patient experience. And it's, we had created a new tool for lung cancer s symptom screening. You know, the idea is to publish that and folks, you know, in the academic community who want to use it to measure outcomes in hospitals can and to have a very um, pre-competitive approach. Because if we create the best methods for discerning benefit, we shouldn't keep that proprietary. Um, as an academic measurement community, we should share it. And so, um, I've been really fortunate that we've received a lot of support to create a number of new endpoints um, that you know folks across the board can use as part of pre-competitive collaborations. And you know, we have been blessed at J and J. We ha we have an asset called BabyCenter.com. We have interactions with 17 million moms where they're talking to us on an ongoing basis. Um, it's amazing to me still that a number of people will tell the website or tell babycenter.com the, the expectant mother will before she tells her husband that she's expecting that she'll tell us because we're anonymous and no one will do anything with that information <laughs> which obviously we, we treat very carefully but throughout her nine month journey and post she she's telling us a lot her her thoughts her expectations her experiences and you know um, margarita talked about twitter there are ways that we're looking at just using semantic analysis and other things on on what she's doing again obviously with her consent and her buy-in that is helpful for her and helpful for us just to understand her experiences and obviously this is in a, a pre-disease state but it, it's it's allowing us to do that and then because there is that relationship you know, I, I'm just amazed where we, we have we've reached out to them and we've asked for a thousand moms to give us input and that's a day study um, because you have that relationship, you have a trust factor, you're providing them information back too, so it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way communication that's really, really helpful to us. So I, I think technology when used appropriately in a trusting way can be very valuable to us.